Today we're going to answer the question, is the PL259 connector sexy? Well, we're probably not going to answer that question. I'll leave that for you to decide. But today we're actually going to talk about the PL259 and the SO239. We're going to talk about several things, including the history. And as a bonus, I'm going to show you how to solder one. My method, at least. I know others have methods that may differ. So let's get to it. So to start off with coaxial connectors, we should start off with coaxial cable, but I'm going to cover that in another video. So let's talk, let's give a brief history of coaxial cables and how they relate to coaxial connectors and the PL259. In the early days, hams didn't use coaxial cable, believe it or not. We used, and a lot of us still do, use open wire line, which is basically two conductors spaced apart a certain distance. You could think of it like the TV twin lead that you see on an old TV set, which is basically the same two conductors. And this was very low loss. It was cheap, but it had the disadvantage of being susceptible to noise as it wasn't shielded. And it also had interaction with nearby metallic objects. Then along came coaxial cable coaxial cable, while it did have more attenuation, at, especially at higher frequencies, it did offer a lot of immunity to noise due by virtue of its shielding. And you find that hams and other RF users began using it. In fact, cable TV was made possible through the use of coaxial cable. Here in Sussex County, we are or were on one of the first ever cable systems developed by John Walson of Service Electric. So he basically owned an appliance store and he wanted to demonstrate TVs in his store in Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania. Well, there was no reception because they were down in the bottom of a valley. So he put an antenna up on a mountain. He was a line man with PPL, Pennsylvania Power and Light. And then he ran a cable down the mountain, but he couldn't run twin lead all, all the way down the mountain, so he ran coaxial cable, which was just becoming popularly in use thanks to surplus availability from military applications. And along the way, of course, due to the loss in attenuation, he had to have amplifiers, and he put these amplifiers in people's homes, and they plugged it in, and exchange, they got a free connection to the antenna. And that was a community antenna and that's how you got Community Antenna TV, CATV. Now you know where that acronym comes from. And what we call now Cable TV. Of course, Cable TV today is a lot more sophisticated. You know, you have multiple feeds via satellite, fiber, and like most of the network's fiber now anyway. Anyway, coaxial cable connectors were, of course, developed because you can't just take the coax and push it into the connect you know into the circuit you can solder it on inside of the the circuit but then it becomes difficult to service you have to connect and disconnect and this wasn't practical so some method had to be developed to connect and disconnect coax readily especially if you patch them often you know a lot of times they want to take out coax and plug it in somewhere else so they had to have that capability the PL259 in particular, though, wasn't really developed for RF application. It wasn't developed for CB, it wasn't developed for ham radio, it wasn't developed for pretty much anything RF. It was designed as a video connector, believe it or not, for radar and radar displays. And for that purpose, it served very well. It basically is a banana plug, you know, the kind of plug that's on the side, the side that plugs into a multimeter you know, like one of these multimeters that measures voltage, ohms, and, and um, current. Well, yeah, it, it, it basically is that with a shield on it. Why is this important? Well, the, the issue you have with that is that the coaxial connector, the PL259, will have what you call a non-constant impedance. 
So generally in ham radio or any radio system, you want to have a constant impedance along the um, entire length of the, the coax cable and the connection because if you have SWR, if you have mismatches of impedance along the way or impedance along the way, you'll find that you will have a bump in the standing wave ratio, the SWR, and this will cause you to have a mismatch and then you will find that your whole system becomes a lot less efficient and you lose power and signal thanks to reflections with the SWR being high. So anyway, the coaxial, the SO239 and PL259 system, they have this problem where inside the connector, uh, I think it's about a um, uh, about quarter of an inch in, um, I'll probably correct it on the screen, but it has an impedance of about 35 ohms. And you know normally that ham radio system or CB radio or pretty much most radio today is 50 ohms. So 50 ohms or thereabouts, 50, 52 ohms, and you have this change to 35 ohms. So this is a problem, but it isn't so straightforward. Now, you might think the humble PL259, which is this bad boy over here, is the cause of it, but that's really not true. And the the real culprit, and <laughs> you know, I'm tempting fate here um, with um, jokes, you know, about um, about a certain fruit that was eaten in a garden in Africa somewhere back in early history. Um, that it's the female connector that caused the problem. You know, you see this 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 connector here, and it's pretty much the impedance mismatch happens in the female side of the connector, also known as SO239. Well, this really isn't much, you know, um, for most ham applications, it'll work, right? It'll, it'll work, it'll work up to probably around 300 megahertz with practically no difference. But beyond that, it becomes a little iffy. And then what happens is that you will, that SWR bump, that imp impedance bump is definitely going to um, affect your signal and the power output. So for, you find that on gear in, um, for higher frequencies for UHF microwave, they use a different type of connector. And usually for ham applications, they use the type N connector, N is in November, and we'll cover that next week. Um, I, I, full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the N connector. I use them in my shack a lot, as, except where ham radio equipment pretty much has to have the PL259. Well, all right, so now with that out the way, some equipment actually mitigates this um, problem with the female uh, SO239 female UHF connector. This part here, the dielectric, you'll see here, which is a white part, which is an insulator between the center pin and the outer shield, you'll find that that's a honeycomb. And that honeycomb tends to mitigate the effects of the impedance bump. And it, it comes near to constant impedance, but it's still not perfect. And a lot of times you'll find that it's probably better you just go in another connector. Well, um, I have a few pieces of equipment with that sort of arrangement. Um, unfortunately, they're all in the station. I, I wish I could take it apart, but you'll find these on some SWR meters. I believe some of the Jetstream SWR meters, particularly the VHF ones, they have that, and you'll find the um, honeycomb type of connector on there. All right, so next let's talk about how do we attach one of these to a piece of coaxial cable? And I'm going to explain various methodologies of how we attach them and which one is better than the other, probably, or maybe not, or is it a matter of religion? Well, coming up next. This here is a cable with a connector on the end. You notice how it has the, um, the pretty much the, um, the outer screw here, um, uh, the thread. Uh, and shield and the the um, you have this piece of heat shrink over for strain relief but this is a type N uh oh 
Well, on the other end, I do have a PL259. And you'll find with this common type of PL259, this is actually an Amphenol 831 SP RFX because I use a cheap connector for this jumper. And um, you'll find that I don't have the same strain relief on this one because if you notice the back here is a little difficult to actually put anything on and still have this go back and forth, although some people manage to do it. But why I showed you that one is that there are actually some PL259 connectors that come with, with that same arrangement that allows you to actually um, work it so that you can use a PL259 with the strain relief. So this is an end connector once again. But if you notice, this has a compression nut here, right? So what you would do is you would take the coax. Oh, and I just lost a nut. Anyway, um, you put it in here, whoof, and then you come out the other end, you solder, right? And then you peel back the braid a little bit and you peel it over this nut. Now this nut goes over the coax and then you screw this in, right? And then this here forms a tight compression shield. And this arrangement is good because then you can take a piece of heat shrink and you can put it over this connector here. And when you put it over this connector here, um, you have the strain relief, right? And you still have the front end here that could move freely and you put this on and then you're able to screw it on to your gear and you have the strain relief the strain relief like I showed you in the other one here that um, you know pretty much prevents this from wiggling out and you can you can pretty much see here why I do this now the other good thing is that since this is an end connector I can actually waterproof this um, with some ease here. Okay, and um, get this here. Right. So that I think is um, one of the better methods for attaching PL259s. But you know, uh, a lot of the ham stores they sell these, which is the regular barrel PL259, and this one has a reducer in it actually. You'll see here the back of it. So, you know, you make the most of it. You put your coax in there, you solder the center pin, and then you solder the shield here through these little holes. You're gonna see here. Focus, okay, good. All right. So next, let's talk about crimp versus solder. So there is a matter of debate that's pretty much almost religious among some people that I'm not in a bad way, but you know, it's kind of like um, people just figure that this way is the right way and everything else is going to be the wrong way. Well, I got news for you. Everything uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. With There are different crimp type of connectors that you can use for PL259 and you use a crimper. So the principle of a crimper is that it would compress the a piece of metal around, cylindrical piece of metal around the coax and then it would create a good electrical connection that way through deformation of the metal. So the metal gets deformed and crimped. It's actually a very good method. I have seen a lot of commercial connectors being done that way. It could be very fast. And the big advantage of using crimp is that you're not using heat of a soldering iron. So when you use the heat of a soldering iron, it tends to deform the coax and deform the connector. And this, this could be bad because when you deform the connector, you essentially change the impedance or you might cause short circuit or you might, you know, cause all sorts of things. So generally it's probably a be better idea to crimp. But Crimp connectors can go loose over time if they're not crimped properly. And some people just, you know, they just don't have the, the, um, the skills. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, anything bad. It's just that they don't really, um, you know, they're, they're not as good as crimping it and they don't use proper tools and such. And that's, you know, that's fine. So it's probably easier to solder and the solder connector 
can provide good results. But even in soldering, you'll find that a lot of people, they do two wrong things. Either they heat this part up too much and it deforms the coax again, or they heat it too little and you have cold solder joints inside the holes. So there are two ways around this. One of them, you can use a torch, apply some heat to it and you preheat the, the, the connector, one. Two, you tin the braid before it goes in the connector and you tin the center pin, very important. You tin it, you tin it so that it already has solder in there and it's easy for the solder to melt and fuse together. And you make sure it's clean. So this connector here is, uh, it has a silver plated pin, right? So the silver plated pin is not your problem. The body is nickel plated. And um, you can find connectors that are nickel plated and you can find some that are silver plated. And you'll find the silver plated ones tend to be a little tarnished. And the tarnish is not a bad thing because silver oxide actually conducts electricity better than regular plain silver metal. So if it's tarnished, don't go putting it in a tumbler, don't air blast it, don't try to get it making look pretty. Because if it's ugly, it works better. I mean, true for a lot of, of antenna stuff in ham radio, right? <laughs> You want big and ugly, you don't want, um, you know, small and pretty. Okay, so that, that pretty much is, is those methods. I mean, I still like the idea of the compression connector for the reason that you have the, um, the strain relief. And I, I will show you how I do it on an end connector. Unfortunately, I don't have the PL259 one available here. Maybe if I order one, I could, I could do it. But um, you'll get the idea. And it's a very, um, it's a very elegant way I think and the heat shrink tends to, to give it a nice little touch it also makes it look a little more professional too so that's that all right and uh, let's next do the uh, practical demo and I'll show you my method for attaching coaxial connectors all right so uh, let's get our connector started here the first thing you're going to need is a connector obviously we're going to be using one of these RFX connectors. Now remember I said the difference between the RFX and the regular is a dielectric as you can see there, the insta center insulator. First thing you do is you separate both of them. You take out the shell from the connector body. Set that aside. You're going to need a knife or some sort of blade. And um, you know one of these cheap uh, <laughs> knives should work. And uh, I always recommend that you get a cable cutter. Don't use the pliers because the pliers will deform the cable. It's always good to get a cable cutter with a round inner blade like this. This way you cut it and it will create a nice, some sort of round cut. Next up, I do highly recommend a pair of locking pliers. And for good reason, you use that as a heat sink to prevent heat from deforming the coax. So locking pliers and a good set is priceless. And I, I recommend as well, although I didn't do it in this video, that you get a vise. A vise uh, basically allows you to put the coax in one, um, you know, place and have it available there for you to work on. But um, I didn't do it and you can do it. So it's optional, but highly recommended. And who can forget a multimeter? A multimeter is a great tool to use because you're going to need to check for shorts to make sure that it, uh, it your cable is properly assembled. And you want to set it on the audible continuity indicator if it has one. I highly recommend getting a multimeter with a continuity or indicator and a beep. This way you don't have to look at the multimeter when you're testing your cable. So additionally, you're going to need a 60 watt soldering iron and 6337 solder. Optionally, you can have a torch and a 100 watt or a 100 watt soldering iron for soldering the, the body and shield but um, that'll make life easier. It might not be necessary. And of course, uh, I put the vise as optional, but recommended. So this coax I'm gonna solder here is Davis RF Berry Flex. It is a very good coax to use. I use it on all my antennas where I have jumpers going from the main hard lines up the tower. 
but it has a non-contaminating jacket and it's similar to LMR400 and RG213. So here you see I'm going to use a round cable cutter to make a nice round cut. But I, I did it incorrectly by making a 45 degree or angled cut here, which I'm going to correct very shortly. So um, I did make the cut here and you can actually see here where the cable has a rounder cut rather than a deformed edge. And here I fix it up here a little bit off camera, but um, we're going to end up with the final cut here. And uh, there it is. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to make sure that it's cut nice and round and you don't deform the coax. Okay, so you want to take off about an inch and a half of the uh, outer jacket. Here I'm using a ruler that was actually given to me by um, somebody um, who is uh, a ham who found this in his um, one of his collections it's from the Hudson Amateur Radio Council which used to hold the ham fests in the Hudson Division, the con big conventions. So um, inch and a half, you measure that and you take your knife and you cut it and you want to be very careful and um, that you cut off the insulation. And what you're going to end up with is this. Now you have to be very careful not to nick the braid because you don't want the braid coming off or getting weakened. And uh, you see here I have my inch and a half nicely done and we're ready for the next step. So the next step, you want to take off about one inch of the outer shield. And to do that, use your knife again, and you will end up with one inch of the shield off of the coax. So at this point, you want to take off half an inch of the actual uh, dielectric, the foam dielectric. And uh, so you break out your ruler. It's about 13 millimeters, but it doesn't really line up exactly as you can see here. So about half an inch off. All right, so once that's done, now you want to make sure the shield, no stray wires are there on the shield. You probably want to trim them off. You could use the pliers, you could use the cutters, anything. Just try to get them nice and neat. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it could. Um, it definitely helps. And that center conductor could also use some cleaning. So you might want to clean that off if it's a little dirty, but generally on new coax, it'll be nice and clean. This is old coax I'm using for this demo. So with your hot soldering iron, you go and you tin the center conductor. And how you do this is you can apply some heat to the center conductor and then apply the solder to it. So you're heating up the center conductor and then tinning it there. And uh, be careful with this. The soldering iron can get hot. The camera angles are deceiving, but I did not get burned during this video. But uh, tinning is important because it makes it easy to get the center conductor soldered in. So there are two factors at play here. You definitely have to have a good enough heated soldering iron and you also need to have a nice clean conductor here. If you don't have both of them, you'll run into problems. And uh, it's also good to have good solder. 6337 lead and tin solder is pretty much a standard what you're using. If you silver solder, it might work, but you're probably gonna need more heat and it's generally not worth it. So once your center conductor is tinned, you're going to be doing the next step, which is putting the shell on the coax. So first you take apart the connector like this, and uh, you may have taken it apart already in previous step. You make sure you put that shell on. There are so many people who forget to do it. And then, oops, they put their connector on and there's no way to put it back. So you do that. And then you take the connector, you make sure that center braid, I mean that the, the shield, the braid, is nice and away from the center conductor and you screw on this connector here taking care for the center conductor to stay inside of the hole and um, it might be a little easier if you have a vise but once it start once it goes in there and it can't go anymore you're good and you're ready for the next step which is to solder your center connector okay so once that's in you proceed now to solder the center conductor and the key here is that you have enough heat so that you don't spend a lot of time, but you don't have too much heat that you burn the coax itself. So it's always good to act quickly and do this quickly so that you're not spending a lot of time deforming the coax. You also want to take care that you don't leave a bulbous amount of solder on the tip of the center pin 
because that can definitely cause problems with getting the connector inserted into equipment to begin with and also it might cause some damage so it's better to just get enough solder in there but not too much. So the next step is you want to place the locking pliers on the connector and you put it back there. This way it'll act as a heat sink and it might even offer you some mechanical stability if you don't have a vise. But um, you adjust the locking pliers just so that it is not crushing the connector but it's gripping onto it firmly. There's a little bolt on the back of the locking pliers that you use to adjust it and it will keep things nice and tight. So the very next step, make sure your soldering iron is nice and heated and then you apply some heat to the connector. This might take a while, um, but you know, of course for video purposes we're going to speed it up. Make sure it's nice and hot. The heat sink in the form of the locking pliers is going to keep things nice and cool, at least not to deform the coax. So you apply your heat and then once it's sufficiently hot, you will apply the solder to fill the holes. This is where some people tend to use a torch and while that might work, um, it, it, you have to be very careful not to melt the coax and um, it, could, it could become problematic if it does get melted. So at this point we are filling in all those holes and this um, pretty much is a standard procedure. Uh, you might want to move the soldering iron closer just to get it closer. Again, if you're using a torch, you heat it up. Um, I'd recommend keeping some distance and you basically put the, um, the solder in those holes and it should melt rather easily. Now you notice you're going to have some extra solder blobs in there. You want to try to clean that up as much as possible and uh, try to get everything nice and flat and definitely want to make sure that the solder braid is soaked with solder and you can do that eventually once things cool you do a mechanical twist you just twist it mechanically to make sure it doesn't wiggle around So you're going to end up with something similar to this and if you notice I took the connector now and I basically am screwing it on to the coax, um, to the coax body. Things are nice and cool and I didn't have a lot of solder blobs or anything so um, we should be good. There's minimum uh, to almost no deformation in the coax, um, the coax insulator, the coax jacket so we're all good with this one. Next we do our final checkout with the multimeter and then we'll be good to go. Okay, so I have here my multimeter. I'm going to put it in the continuity setting and we are going to basically do a basic short test on the coax and hopefully that goes well. Okay, so here we're doing a short test. I put the, um, the negative on the shield and I put the positive on the center and we test and hopefully it comes out good. Right? Yay, no shorts. Now the other thing we could do is we, we test the continuity between the center pin and also the other end of the coax when we assemble the other end. Okay, that's it for this episode. Until next time, we're going to do one on the end connector next time. And uh, be sure to bring your questions, put them in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Those who have subscribed already, thank you very much. It really helps me and it helps to keep this channel growing and bringing you more videos. So until then, until next time, I'm going to try to release the next one on Saturday or Sunday. This one came a little late because I had some problems uh, editing, but um, we'll definitely try to bring the next one on, on the weekend. Remember, I have Q&A on Thursdays, so if you want your questions answered, leave them in the comments below and I will definitely take a whack at them. Now, um, I really do need those questions, so if you have anything at all you want to ask about ham radio, let me know. Anything is fair game about ham radio. Until then, 73 and keep on hamming, N2RJ, see ya.